Hey everybody, it's Grant and it's Wednesday, August 15th, time for episode 258 of Patriots Beat on the CLNS Media Network. Find us at clnsmedia.com. Follow us on Twitter at Patriots CLNS. Every neighborhood has a heartbeat, a place that represents the cultural epicenter of the area at its very core. In Boston's historic North End, that place is Boston Barber and Tattoo. Boston Barber and Tattoo has become a home to A-list Boston celebrities like Gordon Hayward, Milan Lucic, Brad Marchand, and Aaron Baines. Boston Barber and Tattoo is more than just Boston's most well-known corner barber shop. It's also a tourist attraction for the hundreds of thousands of people that visit the North End throughout the year. Boston Barber and Tattoo, a North End landmark that represents the cultural epicenter of the area at its core, located at 113 Salem Street. This week, I welcome back Bob Sosi, who has expanded his horizons to the TV booth with partner Scott Zolak on the Patriots television preseason broadcast last week. Bob was at the mic for a dramatic come-from-behind 26-17 win over the Redskins. What do you think, Bob? Am I selling it a bit too hard? <laughs> well, it's good to be with you once again, that's for sure, Mike, and uh, you can sell it as hard as you wish. Uh, I'll, I'm buying. <laughs> yeah, well, it's football season, Bob, and it was just great to see you on on the uh, tube with uh, Scott Zolak, and you and Zoe had quite the call, uh, quite the second-half performance by Brian Hoyer, in stark contrast to what you guys saw in the first half, right? Yeah, for sure, Mike. I think, you know, you look at uh, the state of the team and a lot of the questions that surround the team, the storylines uh, we look to watch unfold during the course of this preseason, and I think even in the first two, four weeks of the regular season, and that's always the case, it seems, with the Patriots, that uh, questions are still unanswered in September, and we don't really start to uh, see clarity come into picture until the second month of the season. But going into the preseason opener against the Redskins, I think if you identified the top areas of concern, at least intrigue, you would start with the defense looking for improvement over the way that the Patriots finished last year, of course, with Super Bowl 52. Right. You'd look at the left tackle position and the offensive line in general, the wide receiver position, uh, considering the departure of Danny Amendola, some of the injuries in training camp, the suspension looming for Julian Edelman. And, and I think you'd look at the running back situation and the competition there with what what, what we would you know, summarize as a, a pretty deep backfield when it comes to NFL experience and ability of guys vying for a spot on the roster. And to go back to the first one, the defense, it was a difficult start going up against the 2-3 uh, Redskins offense. You had Colt McCoy, the backup quarterback out there for Washington, not a lot of regulars playing, and yet the Redskins scored on, on three of their first four or five possessions. They put 17 points on the board and had a 17 nothing lead. And just more than that, some of the conversions, uh, when you look at third down situations and whatnot, and granted, there's not a whole lot of scheming or strategizing going yeah. on, but nonetheless, you look for guys to win one-on-one battles and you know, maybe get more pressure on the quarterback, or in the case of Kyle Van Noy, for example, early on, a linebacker getting beat by a running back in coverage. You know, that's something that was a problem for the Patriots from day one last year against Kansas City. So, you know, you look at that and say, okay, that, that was definitely a con on Thursday, if you will. Some of the pros, the performance I thought of Jeremy Hill, the former Bengal, I thought he really uh, took a step forward in the competition, seemingly by Gillisley at that position. You look at some of the young guys who made plays out there, and there were people like Jawan Bentley, the rookie linebacker out of Purdue, I thought were very impressive. Uh, and as far as the wide receiver position goes, I, you know, there still are a lot of questions uh, regarding that group. And as far as the offensive line is concerned, Mike, I think Trent Brown has really solidified his spot at left tackle. And you could see just watching him, if he had not been out at practice as we've been, uh, that all the talk about how athletic he is is justified. And you see the 6'8 Brown out there, you know, running, uh, whether it's uh, on, a, on a running play to get out or a screen, uh, trying to get out and, and, and block somebody, he moves extremely well. Uh, and, you know, we're going to continue to see some of the storylines uh, evolve and, and some of the answers come into picture in the next couple of weeks. And as I said earlier, some of them, you know, we won't know until uh, you know, well after the season begins. You know, Bob, I, I want to focus on one of the positions, and this is one of those areas, certainly, I think people sometimes can erroneously read more into it, including yours truly, than there is actually there. But Dante Hightower, playing every defensive series except one in the first half, I believe it was, 
And he was on the field a lot. And certainly I'm sure some of that, or a lot of it, is shaking off rust, right? And I know um, yep. your colleagues on the on the broadcast were saying as much, Zoe and, and certainly Rob Ninkovich, uh, with direct experience in that regard, were making that case. But the Dante Hightower, Jawan Bentley dynamic is interesting to me. And he was asked about, Dante Hightower was asked about this on Monday, um, that, you know, is this a guy... Who could be taking over Hightower's job at some point? Perhaps down the road, Mike. He's got to make the team first, <laughs> as we know. And, and uh, absolutely. But you know where I'm going down. with this, right? I mean, Jawan Bentley is a downhill pounder, and he's a, he's a linebacker. He had the green dot the other night, right? Yep, absolutely. And one of one of several, but... Go ahead. No, I was just saying, I think, I think you know, your, 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 point is, your point is well taken in the sense that he may not become the, the, the player. I mean, Hightower is a first round pick for a reason, and he's a guy with tremendous athletic ability. Granted, somebody that you know has a very physical style and, and you know may not be as strong in coverage as he is in other aspects of the game, but nonetheless, coming out of Alabama as he did, you know, he was identified as a first round pick and taken there for a reason. So Bentley doesn't have that level of athleticism or the skill set. What he does have to go with nonetheless still a very good uh, set of skills and level of performance in college is the resume as a three-time captain someone who was a signal caller in college and, and you could see uh, the way he played the game the other night first the tackle just short of the sticks on a completion so he moved well there and you know, showing off some some good lateral ability but beyond that uh, the patience on a tackle near the goal line where right. a lot of guys might overcommit in that situation. He did not and eventually fills the hole and meets the running back for no gain, if not a loss on that particular play. Uh, so I think you do see a lot of the, the characteristics of somebody who really has a great acumen for the game. And certainly as a three-time captain, you have to infer uh, being the first and produced history that he's also ha- also has a great attitude and, and aptitude for the game. And so I look at, at someone like him and, and say, yeah, you know, he's, he's out there communicating the defense. Uh, he's someone that, uh, you know, has a green dot on the helmet in a preseason game as he did, uh, seemed to be in control, talked about what that experience was like for him yesterday. And, uh, you know, he, he may not be the next Don Day Hightower, but he certainly is a guy of Hightower, has to go down is going to be a candidate or if Dante, you know, has to take a playoff, it could be a candidate to move in and, and, and at least keep the defense organized. And then and you're projecting as well in your case, if he makes the team two, three, four years down the road. Yeah. And, and certainly, I mean, that's hyperbole on my, my part. I mean, we know that Dante Hightower is not only a leader, but he's a captain uh, on that defense and he's very well respected and he's as intelligent as they come on the defense. It just, it does kind of pique your interest or raise an eyebrow when you see Dante playing that long uh, in the first half of the very first preseason game. Another position, Bob, I I want to focus on is the depth in the secondary, which I think is is pretty doggone good. Um, But to not see Jason McCourty out there uh, and you didn't see Devin for that matter either, but not to see Jason McCourty on the field in the first preseason game. What did you make of that? Yeah, it's, it's always hard to gauge, and I think you have to be very careful, especially around here, uh, to to not read into uh, who played or who didn't play or how many reps someone played too much. You know, perhaps it's just a case where there are guys that they like, and 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 I and I'm with you. I think there's some really young uh, athletic. Uh, candidates that have a have a great chance not only to, to make the team but contribute to the team as well uh, on the back end. And when I look at guys like Jason McCordy, you know, maybe part of it is he's a known commodity. Uh, they, you know, they, he's been around the league and they, and they know what they have. And, and I think it's also part, perhaps why he didn't play as much in OTAs in the spring or in the passing camp when some of the younger guys got a look and they may want to see, you know, how how is JC Jackson going to respond in this situation, we'll put him out there and, and, and does he do what we tell him to do? Uh, does he go where he needs to go? How does he respond out there playing with Dante Hightower? Same thing with some of the younger guys like Keon Crossan, uh, for example. And those are two of the rookies behind Duke Dawson, uh, who was the second round pick out of Florida, who I think been clearly ahead of them from day one. And, and I do believe that Jackson is a guy that has a, has a bead right now and a spot on this team if he continues to improve. And, and, and at least at least he has a great opportunity. Maybe he doesn't have a bead on the spot, but he has a great opportunity to make it, Mike. 
then beyond that, you, you do wonder. You know, Jason is is someone who I think he, in in the practice drills that we've watched uh, has not you know excelled to the point where you would say, hey, this guy's he's going to be on the team. And I think whether it's inactivity or based on what we've seen from activity, uh, it, it's certainly fair to say that he's he's a guy right now who's who's on the bubble and, and really is in a stiff competition to make it uh, as a cornerback. And of course, you look at Gilmore. That's a different case. He's he's the left cornerback for this team, and, and maybe right. on the other side, Eric Rowe is ahead of uh, any competition there. And then there's John Jones, who came back off the the foot surgery on the last couple of days. Has been active defensively, and he's got experience having played in the secondary last year in the playoffs against Tennessee quite extensively. Uh, so uh, you look at those three guys, and, and you know. Where, where are you going to fit in along with Dawson? And if you're Jason McCourty, you've got to beat out these young guys who are going to be around here if they make the team for at least four years. In his case, it's probably a one-year and done situation. You know somebody you didn't mention that is, I think, a pretty fascinating case? Cy Jones. Cyrus Jones. I mean, this is a guy, second-round pick in 2016, and you know certainly could play a factor, right, Bob, in the in the return game in the first four weeks of the season, uh, with uh, Julian Edelman sitting out with a suspension. No question about it, Mike. And I think you know that's an interesting uh, scenario, or at least competition on special teams when you're talking about punt returner for the Pats, because you have these young guys like McCarron and Burrios as wide receivers trying to earn a spot. And I think, you know, Barrios is a player who's been drafted out of the University of Miami this year and come into camp a little bit behind because of an injury and inactivity uh, in, the, in, in the spring for the most part. But I think he's a guy that, you know, has probably searched ahead of McCarron. Riley's had a, 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 it seems a tough stretch over the course of the last week or so. Uh, but you know, unless one of those guys really excels in that role, catching punts and returning punts back there and, 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 and really takes a big uh, step forward in the receiving game, trying to vie for a slot receiver spot. Well, then maybe Cyrus Jones, you know, gets on the team for that very reason. Uh, you know, last year he got off to a, a good start to camp. I thought he was catching punts after overcoming, it seems some hurdles, his rookie season in the secondary in the preseason ha- had some troubles in the Jacksonville game. Uh, eventually I think, if not mistaken, he even played a little bit of safety in that fourth preseason game and, and, and seemed to be playing a little more confidence out there against the Giants. And then he tears the ACL. And now off the long road to recovery, he's trying to make this team once again, again, with a belated start to preseason uh, training camp uh, because he was on the lower field for much of the first couple of weeks. And we've only had a chance to see him get out there and play defense and, and catch some balls uh, in, in the return game uh, the last couple of days. So he's, he's somebody who, who definitely continues to bear watching, and I think the situation uh, in, in the punt return aspect with those other guys uh, may, may lead to you know, Cyrus Jones being on his team, if not as a cornerback specifically, then, then as a punt returner primarily. Speaking with Bob Sosi, the very talented and now versatile broadcaster of the New England Patriots on not only the radio network, but the preseason television network as well, along with Scott Zolak. I want to tell you about RX Bar. RX Bar is a whole food protein bar. What does that mean? RX Bar wants to build things the right way. RX Bar believes in the power of transparency and lets the core ingredients do all the talking with all of them listed on the front of the packaging. You'd likely recognize RX Bar at shelf. They're the ones who have the egg whites for protein, dates to bind, and nuts for texture, and other delicious ingredients like unsweetened chocolate, real fruit, and spices like sea salt or cinnamon. Turns out the real food ingredients actually taste really good, and I can vouch for this. Personally, I love the mint chocolate protein bar from RX Bar. Great flavor, no aftertaste, and for me, it has a great boost for that afternoon workout or long walk that I take to stay awake, especially if I'm working a late-night Patriots game, which we all do, Bob Sosi, in the preseason. Now, for my listeners, for 25% off your first order at rxbar.com, use the promo code TRAGS, that's T-R-A-G-S, that's rxbar.com backslash TRAGS for a 25% discount at checkout. 
Speaking again with Bob Sosi of the Patriots Radio Network, along with the preseason television network. Bob, by the way, but before we go on any further, how is it different being a TV broadcaster in the booth <laughs> than it is a radio broadcaster? <laughs> well, it's a lot different, Trags, uh, especially uh, uh, when it's got Zolak says you, you, your mother thinks you have a face made for radio as you declared to our audience about me <laughs> in our broadcast open first time appearing on camera Thursday night. But, uh, yeah, I, I fully admit that, uh, I was certainly a uh, far, uh, uh, more qualified uh, physically, uh, for radio than television, but nonetheless, uh, as a TV broadcaster, a novice, certainly on the, in football, uh, on a telecast as opposed to a radio broadcast, I've been college basketball, on the TV uh, for some time, but it's a different animal. And, you know, Vince Gulley, the great baseball announcer, says it best. In baseball, on radio, you're working with a blank canvas. You're painting the picture. Well, the right. same is true with football, of course, or any other sport. In television, it's the director's medium, so you're just writing the captions. Well, to take that a couple of steps further in our case, because really we're not doing a typical conventional telecast of a football game. It's not play, call, analysis, replay, play, call, analysis, replay. It's the conversation that, right. oh, by the way, includes some periodic play-by-play -play calls. And not only is it a conversation between you and your partner in the booth, there's a person you don't see who's on the sideline who eventually is going to have an open mic, who's going to be part of the discussion. And then periodically you're going to go to a studio with two other voices who deserve to be heard. And so for me... It's juggling all the elements of the conversation components and being the traffic cop to make sure that we know what's happening in the game, but also Zoe can follow up on something Rob Nikovich said, or I can raise a question to Rob, or go to Andy Hart or Paul Perillo in, in the studio here at Gillette Stadium. And then on top of that, you have graphic packages, you have advertising drop-ins, you have pictures that you're supposed to address when you see a shot of someone on the sideline, for example, and it's Dante Skarnacchia, we have to be well prepared to you know, fill, fill some context to what the fans are seeing and you know, let people know about you know, that guy who's on their screen if you can. And so all, all those different things made for you know, quite a challenge for me. It was a lot of fun. You know, certainly, I thought Rob Nikovich was terrific in his role, a real natural considering it was the first time he's been in a situation like that. Zoe is Zoe. Zo handles it, yeah. you know, and, and though he does sure. everything else. He has a lot of fun with a lot of great insight and, uh, and you know, certainly has some fun at my expense and, and, and uh, some others too. But uh, it, it was, I thought, overall, uh, especially for the first journey uh, of four for us, you know, a, a pretty successful voyage considering what others have said. You know, I'm a pretty harsh critic of myself, and I've got a couple of pages of notes that, you know, I've made from the telecast things that I need to improve on, certainly this Thursday night, but it seemed to be pretty well received, and I think that's really owed to Zoe and Nink and what they brought to the broadcast, and, and as well the, the, the way that everybody, I thought, you know, had, had some insight to share with the audience that allowed the viewer to come away from the broadcast saying, you know, I know a lot more about this player or that player or this aspect of the game than I did before I tuned in. So, you know, if you can continue, continue to do that, well, then it's a successful call. Well, and, and I got to tell you, you are one of the most privileged broadcasters I have known in the National Football <laughs> League. And I've known a few. I have known a few. And then obviously you um, have uh, succeeded the late, great Gil Santos. Um, I mean, your thoughts on, on Gil and, and his passing recently and the legacy he left behind as a Patriots broadcaster, a, Hall, a Patriots Hall of Famer, obviously. Yeah, and I think that's the last line. He's a Hall of Famer, and it's not just the broadcaster's wing of the Hall of Fame. It's He's a Hall of Famer with a red jacket, and there have only been 25 of them, uh, if memory serves. And, uh, for me, you know, Gil Santos is still the voice of the Patriots and always will be. And he had the classic voice, but beyond that, the great sense of humor, uh, the ability to paint the picture uh, as well as, if not better, than anybody who's done it in a football broadcast booth, uh, the legacy that he leaves includes, you know, willingness to help mentor young people, uh, including myself. When I reached out to him uh, before I got the Patriots job, in fact, 
after moving to Boston, uh, just after 985, the Sports Hub launched. I've talked to Steve Jones, the longtime voice and the terrific play-by-play announcer for Penn State. He will tell you that Gil helped to mentor him. And when I look at you know the body of his career and we hear the classic calls, to me, not to be forgotten and, and certainly not overshadowed by his call of Vinatieri's game-winning kick against the Raiders or in Super Bowl 36 or however many other memorable moments you want to take from the dynastic years. To me, Gill was as good, if not even better, Mike, in the early years when the Patriots were the laughing stock around the league and when the Patriots games weren't available to fans on television because they were blocked, blacked out. And so people in this region who follow the paths and learn football, get it through the words and the eyes of Gil Santos. And, and to me, that, you know, that speaks to how great he was as much as anything. Three of your first four years, right, uh, with the Patriots, Bob, have ended in Super Bowl calls. Is that right? I've been fortunate, to say the least, Mike. Uh, I've, I've been the broadcaster now for, for five seasons, entering my six. Okay. So the first year, the Pats went to the AFC Championship. And, right. you know, you walk away from the booth after the Pats lost to Denver in that game out in Colorado in 2014, January of 14, and you wonder, well, you know, what an experience, so close to getting a chance to call a Super Bowl. And for many announcers, that's as close as you'll ever come. You get that one shot, if that. You know, I've talked to guys in this league that I have tremendous respect, respect for who went years, decades, without calling a playoff game, or at least close to a couple of full decades without calling a playoff game. John Murphy, the voice of the Bills, and until last year hadn't called a playoff game, and he's been in the Buffalo radio booth as the play-by-play guy for you know, close to 20 years. Uh, when I look at my good fortune, you know, to go away from that booth and then be back there again a year later at the AFC Championship, the Patriots winning, and then going on to Super Bowl 49 and beating the Seahawks in thrilling fashion, the greatest comeback in Super Bowl history. And then you turn around and you get a chance to do it again a couple of years later, and they top it with a comeback against the Atlanta Falcons that's even more remarkable. And, uh, you know, you get back there again the next year as, as a radio announcer and. Uh, you know, you, you never want to take anything for granted. And I, and I try to remind myself of what great fortune I have. And honestly, just to call a preseason game in the NFL is, is a dream come true. But to be able to call so many postseason games and so many thrilling, uh, dramatic games with remarkable finishes and, and plays like Malcolm Butler intercepting Russell Wilson, Julian Edelman making that <clears throat> remarkable catch. Uh, on the tip ball against the Falcons and James White scoring in the first ever Super Bowl overtime to win it for the Pats. And even last year, as disappointing as the ending was, I mean, to to be there and, and just have a chance to try to document what was going on as the Patriots and the Eagles were going back and forth. Um, I, I can't describe, you know, how, how, how fortunate I feel. Uh, and I probably, you know, take it for granted far too often and don't appreciate it as much as I should. Let me ask you, uh, how much do you think about the calls during the game, uh, during a game that is monumental as the Super Bowl? Like, are you thinking about, if this turns out this way, I want to make sure that I have these words in my mind or from in my mind, ready to go, transmitting them to my mouth? No. I, you know, honestly, I think that when I've done that, I, I found myself in trouble. I think when, when you're at your best, it's almost an out-of-body experience. And, and Zoe said the same thing, too. Uh, in, in calling the the, the the win over the Seahawks and, and the Falcons in particular, uh, it was a case where you, you, you get so caught up in the moment and you know, you're so focused. You, sure. you, you're, you're, your motivation primarily is don't screw it up. And honestly, for example, when Jermaine Curse made that incredible catch along the sideline, and I had said Malcolm Butler knocks it in completely. Oh, no, Curse caught it. He caught it. And the camera, you know, unreal. I was so upset with myself in the, in the immediate aftermath. And you've got to come back and call the next play, which very well could be a, a touchdown that's a game winner for Seattle or some remarkable play by the Patriots that's a game concert for them. Well, in the moment, at first I'm thinking to myself, you screwed up right. that call on this stage. You've got to bear it down. Don't screw up the next one. It's just so focused on the nuts and the bolts. And it happened so quickly Shotgun snap to Wilson, and before I knew it, in the blink of an eye, the ball's intercepted. 
And it's not a play that I was anticipating before the ball was snapped like anybody else who watched that game. And so you, you, you really have to mind, you know, for lack of a, a better cliche, your P's and Q's and, and, and get it right. Just try to describe what's happening. And, and you know, again, I, I'd say the same thing about Super Bowl 52. I mean, in 51, that you know, whether it's a loss to the Eagles and it's that desperation heaved by Brady at the end, or it's the Pats coming back against the Falcons and it's James White taking the toss sweep in for a touchdown, you're so focused on the situation and calling the play that you're not really thinking about what it's going to sound like in the echoes of history on NFL films. I mean, that's, that's something I think you, you might think about it before the game a little bit, but I, in, 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 you know, I try not to, to script anything uh, because you want it to be spontaneous. I find that if something is, is contrived, it's going to sound contrived. And the best moments, again, for lack of a, a better, better term these days, are organic. They happen naturally. They're born out of the emotion of the moment, whether it's Al Michaels and Do You Believe in Miracles or Russ Hodges and the Giants win the pennant. Uh, you know, you, you, to me, I think you want authenticity. And there have been times too, Mike, I learned from in my past where they're calling Navy games or any other team. And maybe, you know, early on in my Patriots career, where you, where you thought about those things a little too much and they didn't, they didn't come out the way uh, you you, you hope they would, that they did sound uh, unoriginal. And uh, for me, I think the big thing is try to get it right. But more than that, it's don't screw it up. Okay, real quick as we wrap it up, Bob, the revenge factor this Thursday night, the Eagles coming back to town with Doug Peterson's group uh, coming to Foxborough on Thursday night. <laughs> what do you think the the genuine atmosphere is going to be before the game? Is it just another preseason game or – Will there be among the Patriot veterans who suit up for this game, who also suited up for Super Bowl 52, will there be a little thought of, I wish, maybe we should go out and play harder and, you know, put some of the memories of last February uh, in the rearview mirror? How do you think they'll approach it? I think the only, yeah, I think the only player, it seems to me, based on what he has said and what's been uh, heard out of Philadelphia, who might approach the game, <laughs> the game thinking about Super Bowl 50. Uh, two is Lane Johnson of the Eagles. Um, you know, especially you, you know, as a broadcaster, a fan when we're watching Nick Sutfeld or Joe Callahan or even maybe Christian Hackenberg play for the Eagles late in the game against Dan Gettling uh, for the Patriots on the other side of quarterback. You know, I don't think anybody's going to be looking at it as a, as a rematch or a game to exact revenge. Uh, there is nothing the Patriots could do uh, when you look back at last year's ending to the Super Bowl to get even with the Philadelphia Eagles, even if the Pats beat the Eagles this year in the, in the Super Bowl, because there are going to be a number of players who were in that game that won't be in the next game. This is a preseason game. It's a, another stepping stone for young people trying to make the team and move up the depth chart and get themselves in a position where they're under strong consideration to make the team. And for veterans, it's another opportunity to work on things, to get better, to knock the rust off, as you say, whether you're Dante Hightower or perhaps Julian Edelman. Maybe Tom Brady plays in this game. We'll see. And for him, it's an opportunity to work with new receivers. But the guys who are veterans, the guys who played in that game last year, they're smart enough to know the way it is, especially in Foxborough. That game is totally irrelevant when it comes to this game. And I think you could probably expect the same for most of the Philadelphia Eagles. And as I say, save for one Lane Johnson. And, Bob, uh, as we wrap it up, how can people follow you on social media and online? Hey, Mike, I appreciate it. You know, I, 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 I tend uh, not to tweet as much as uh, the uh, uh, colleagues that you and I, of course, of course both have the privilege of, of working with and following. But nonetheless, I do appreciate anybody who wants to follow. Often it's uh, non-football uh, material. Um, so uh, I, 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 and I say that with, uh, with a, a caveat that uh, – or a disclaimer that uh, you know my 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 my, my Twitter timeline is is filled uh, with uh, a lot of retweets of stories that I find are very interesting and, and you know appeal to human interest. Uh, but it's at Bob Sosi, B O B S O C C I. Uh, I do have a Facebook page, which I'm I'm, I'm in the process of uh, reminding myself to to update more frequently this coming season. Put some stuff on there, especially you know when we're at other stadiums and around the league, uh, you know. Uh, get some get some more uh, 
posts up on that. Uh, I work, of course, as you know, not only for the Patriots and, and Patriots.com, but also for 98.5 The Sports Hub. And, uh, you know, this is good practice for me because we're uh, going to be launching a podcast on Pat's site uh, when the regular season begins. And we're in the process of working on something as well for 98.5 The Sports Hub. It will be a football-centric podcast naturally, but, you know, maybe take some time to explore some of the issues that don't necessarily focus uh, on, on Foxborough or, or, or the, the Patriots are a center of. We talk about you know things with regards to the history of the league or the strategy, personnel uh, in, in the NFL in, in general. And, uh, you know, looking forward to, to, to reaching out and, and, and having a lot of fun with some different people who cover football, who are in football, who've been executives in football over the course of the next five, six months for that. Well, I'm glad I could get you some reps there, Bob. Uh, to, to keep it in the football <laughs> vernacular, anytime I can give you some extra reps, I'm happy to be your Bill Belichick. I want to thank everyone. Hey, for Mike, da- yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I do appreciate that, Mike. And I, I often think of you and, 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 and Bill as almost one and the same, uh, con- <laughs> considering your dogged work ethic. Nobody in Boston media, and I say this sincerely, uh, that I've seen in my time here uh, works uh, harder than Mike to try to use a a Belichick uh, uh, refrain. Nobody works harder, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, This is a guy that uh, folks has been out at Gillette Stadium any number of days and covered the Patriots during the day and then hustled down to Fenway Park or TD Garden uh, to cover the Red Sox or the Bruins and Celtics and then been right back at it the next day. Well, it's a labor of love, Bob. I appreciate that. There's very, very kind words, and thank you. I want to thank everyone for downloading today's podcast. I want to thank our terrific guest, Bob Sosi of the Patriots Radio Network and, of course, the Patriots Preseason Television Network. Now, I want to also thank our sponsors, Boston Barber and Tattoo and RX Bar, for producer Michael Angi, our executive producer Larry H. Russell, and the founder of the network, Nick Gelso. This is Mike Petralia. And this has been the Patriots Beat Podcast, powered by CLNS Media.